This is our Sunday School lesson for September the 3rd, 2017. It is from our standard lesson commentary print. And this is lesson number one. It's entitled The Rainbow. And it is from unit one. And our lesson's devotional reading is from the book of Isaiah, the 54th chapter, verses 1 through 10. Our background scripture is Genesis, the 8th chapter, verses 20, and also the 9th chapter, verses 17. And our printed text is Genesis, the 8th chapter, verses 20 through 22, and also the ninth chapter, verses 8 through 17. And our key verse is, I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. Genesis 9, verses 11. Our lesson's aims uh, for this Sunday School lesson are list the elements of the covenant God made with Noah and all living creatures on the earth after the flood, Compare and contrast the Noahic covenant with other covenants made by God, and then write a statement or a commitment uh, to honor the covenant relationship he or she enjoys as a believer in Christ. Our lesson discusses the covenants. It discusses the covenant that God made with Noah and the emphasis of the promise that was conveyed in the words of God as spoken to Noah and how that promise was defined and kept. And so as we look into our lesson today, we will try and entertain and address the issue of the covenant. The covenant, as defined by our dictionaries, is a agreement. It is a engagement. It is a bond between two individuals or two parties, and it is based upon the words that are spoken in the agreement and the promise to fulfill on that which was agreed upon. And so as we look at the covenant that God has made with mankind, we understand that one party in the covenant is able to fulfill all that that party has spoken. God is able to fulfill the words that God speaks in the covenant. The engaging party or partner we find many times uh, has failed on fulfilling their or our end of the agreement. But we will look at some of the items that are lifted in our commentary. Uh, one of the first things that we should entertain is the discussion on the flood and its various commentaries or 
its various representations. Uh, the standard lesson commentary alludes to the fact that the biblical account of the great flood is just one of the resources that are lifted from various other sacred and ancient writings. And with the advanced technology that we have today in archaeological studies, we find that the story of the Great Flood, or as some even uh, mention and describe it as the Deluge, uh, we recognize that there are scripts and clay stones and inscriptions that predate the account uh, recorded in the Bible. But uh, for some, this is a little eerie because uh, we have been taught that the scripture is the authority on all that is written of mankind. Uh, but when these uh, theories and these uh, uh, indoctrinations were established, uh, we were not as advanced as we are in this day and time. And the writers of that time uh, did not have the full access to all of the sacred scripts that are present today. And even those that have already been uh, acknowledged and recognized and critiqued and investigated, uh, they don't account for the others that are still unknown. The point being here is, is that it doesn't uh, denounce or discredit the fact that the, there was a great flood. The earth was covered with a tremendous amount of water. And whether it is from an archaeological point of view or a biblical account, both documentations and both of the data that is collected, whether it is uh, from a religious point of view or a scientific point of view, prove that the one element, the true existence, the divine order that we refer to as God, that God's creation had a period and a time where the earth the earth that was known to mankind at that time was covered in water. And as we look at this, um, there is some other accounts that should be addressed here as well. Now, when I say the existence, the divine order, the element and the presence of creation, uh, which we refer to as God. When we look into verse 21, our commentary mentions how Moses uses a figurative language, uh, also described as an anthropomorphic expression, speaking of and God smelled the sweet savior, a uh, sweet savor uh, of the offering, the burnt offerings that were offered by Noah at the altar. Um, and so the commentary goes on to explain that since God is a spirit, John 4, 24, we need not assume that God smells things the same way we do. And so, um, or it, it mentions that the same manner of figurative language is used when scripture speaks of the hand and the arm of God. And so we have tried to 
explain or to express this entity that is beyond our comprehension. We have used a physical and humane expression to bring its presence closer to our understanding. And even in that effort, we still fall very short in our sincerest uh, engagement of trying to define that which is beyond our definition and our comprehension. Uh, but uh, we use these anthropomorphic phrases and figurative language to make it seem more simplistic and common to our understanding. So we look in to our lesson and recognize that God has made a promise unto Noah and to Noah's family about what is about to take place and then what God's promise is after the event unfolds. Now, as we look at the preceding chapters in Genesis uh, 6 and also Genesis 7, it gives us a background as to what is actually uh, spoken of in Genesis 8 in verses 20 through 22. Where, most, uh, where Noah is actually building the altar to make the sacrifice unto the God of Israel, the God of the whole of creation, the only one and true existence and the creative force throughout all that is. So when we look at this, we see that a sacrifice was offered. And many times uh, we think of the animal sacrifices. Uh, we know that scripture is full of the uh, sacrifice or the shedding of blood of goats and of the turtle doves, of uh, burnt offerings that were used, sheep, and, uh, the uh, oxen. We recognize that the sacrifice of purity throughout Scripture has been offered for the wickedness and the evil of man. And when we recognize and read into Hebrews and realize uh, what scripture says to us about how God felt about the continuation of this persistent and continuing sacrificing of animals for the sins committed by man and how this constant ritualistic practice uh, aggravated the spirit of God that we begin to just continue in our behavior and then substitute the sacrifice of that which was pure because the selection of the animal sacrifice had to be those that were without blemish and young before they became aged and contaminated with the ways of mankind. And so when we think of what is at stake when sacrifices are offered, what is at stake is, is that that which is good is destroyed, that that which is evil may be pardoned. And so <clears throat> here God is speaking unto Noah and saying that he is going to establish a, another covenant with Noah and his seed. 
Noah's sons and family. And so uh, the covenant that was established with them, as he says in verse 11, that I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of flood. Now, it says, neither shall all flesh be cut off. Now, the inference here speaks of when we speak of the deluge, the great flood, that which was in the world at that time was destroyed except for the family of Noah. We, since that time, have had many floods. And although our lesson is speaking of the biblical flood, in our nation today, we are experiencing another flood, the flood of named Harvey in Houston, Texas, where thousands of individuals are now homeless and the count has not been sat, has not been established on how many have died in this flood. So where the scripture says that no more will neither will all flesh be cut off anymore by the waters of the flood, uh, it did not say that there would still be some that would perish because we are still having uh, catastrophic examples or incidents of nature. Uh, but it did say that neither shall any more be a flood to destroy the entire earth. So while Houston is encountering a flood, uh, those of us in other parts of our nation and in other parts of the earth are not encountering the flood that is occurring in Houston at this time. So uh, the lesson spoke of comparing the different uh, covenants, the different agreements that were made between the divine and righteous and holy spirit, God and mankind. And starting out with the Adamic covenant, and then we move to the Noahic covenant, and then the Abrahamic covenant, the Pas uh, Palestinian covenant, and then the Mosaic covenant, the Davidic covenant, and lastly, the covenant that God said that he would make. And this is out of Hebrews, the eighth chapter. And this is the covenant that we live under today that says that, and the Lord said, I will put my laws, which were once written on tablets and stone, and I will place these in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Uh, some of the covenants were general covenants. The Noahic covenant was a general, it was between God and Noah. Uh, the Ad uh, Abrahamic covenant was an unconditional covenant. Uh, when we look at the Palestinian covenant, that was an unconditional covenant, but it was based upon the obedience and the disobedience of the people of Israel. And the covenant in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy the 30th chapter, spoke of if they obeyed God, what would happen, and if they disobeyed God, what would happen there would be a blessing and a curse. And so we are now living under the covenant that was fulfilled, that was prophesied in the Old Testament, but was fulfilled in Christ. And so as we look at the sacrifices and we look at the agreements that God has made through generations, bringing us all the way up to today. Uh, the question 
that uh, should be asked as in our lesson, which was stated, and write a statement of commitment to honor the covenant relationship that he or she enjoys as a believer in Christ. What we should ask ourselves is, has the Spirit of God written his request in our minds? Is, it, is the conviction of the requirements, the request, and the agreement that we entered into once we became spiritually renewed, is that written in our hearts? And are we being compelled and convicted by that agreement, by that relationship with God? Is it being demonstrated and shown in our actions and in our behavior and in our attitude? Or is it just spoken words that come out of our mouths? There is much that we could have discussed from the scriptures that were lifted in our lesson. But I believe that I have said what the divine order wanted to be shared in this lesson. I hope that what has been said has provided some insight and has uh, lifted some concerns and has provided uh, some uh, background and also some interpretation that would lead us towards reaching that agreement that we have made with Almighty God in our spirits and in our heart. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer.